Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. A few years back, some of you might remember, I interviewed Greg Lukianoff on the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, or FIRE, and the state of free speech in the United States. Now, FIRE stands for the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. What changed? Today, on February 13th, 2023, I'm excited to have Nico Perino on this podcast to answer this question. He is FIRE's executive vice president and the creator and host of FIRE's So to Speak, the free speech podcast. He's also the co-director of the 2020 documentary, Mighty Ira, which is about the life and career of former ACLU executive director, Ira Glasser. Go check it out. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Juliet. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Oh, boy. So do you want me to focus on free speech issues that they don't know or general just kind of life advice that they don't know? I got answers for both of them. You can give us both. You can give us either whatever is the most important. OK, well, I'm going to give you the most important for both. So you mentioned my documentary, Mighty Ira, at the top of the show, and I really made that documentary as kind of an educational enterprise for my generation. I'm, I'm a millennial. I just turned 33 this month. Happy uh, and I no, thank you. And I felt like my generation and some of the younger generations have kind of forgotten the reason why we have freedom of expression in the first place and what it's accomplished for our generations and past generations. So, for example, Ira Glasser, who this documentary is about, uh, former executive director of the ACLU for 23 years. Prior to that, he was at the New York Civil Liberties Union. And he really came up at the time when freedom of speech was the cause of the day for civil rights organizers, right? If you didn't have, they had no power. And so all they had was their voices. John Lewis, a great civil rights activist who passed away in recent years, once said that without freedom of speech, the civil rights movement would have been a bird without wings. And Martin Luther King, in his last speech, his uh, mountaintop speech in Memphis, he talked about how local governments were restricting civil rights activists' ability to march in some of these towns through their permitting processes. Uh, and he talks about how if he had lived in Russia or China or some other authoritarian country, he could understand the restrictions on freedom of speech and assembly. But we live in America and we have this promissory note that is the First Amendment. And this note guarantees for us these rights, the right to freedom of speech and assembly. But over the years, it feels like the understanding of the centrality of freedom of expression has been lost to generations after some of these movements for social justice have found success, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the women's right movement, the right, uh, the women's rights movement to get the vote, uh, for example. And now younger generations are seeing it as a tool of the bully, the bigot, or the robber baron, uh, as my boss, Greg Lukianoff, likes to refer to it. Uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, while we all, including the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron, have the right to speak our minds, um, freedom of speech is the right that protects uh, those at the margins of society, those who do not have political power, to agitate for political power. Democracy protects the majority's rights. But, you know, we live in a constitutional republic, and there are certain things that the majority does not get to do to us in the minority. Uh, and that's what freedom of speech protects. Even if you are a lonely voice, out there in a sea of people who disagree with you, the Bill of Rights and specifically the First Amendment protects your right to speak out. So in my documentary, Mighty Ira, we tell the story of why Ira Glasser and his generation of civil libertarians um, decided that they were going to advocate for freedom of speech up to and including defending the rights of neo-Nazis to march in a town of Holocaust survivors in 1978 in the town of Skokie, Illinois. It's a very famous free speech case that I'm sure many of your listeners 
are familiar with. And at the beginning of this documentary, Ira Glasser, who is from Brooklyn, uh, grew up a Brooklyn Dodgers fan, returns to Ebbets Field, the home of the then Brooklyn Dodgers, which is now occupied by an apartment building and meets some young kids outside that apartment building and tells them the story of Jackie Robinson and Ebbets Field that used to uh, live on those hollow grounds. And I return to the camera at one point and says, you know, how do you expect these young people to know any of this history if nobody tells them it? Uh, so that's the enterprise of this documentary, Mighty Ira, which can be found uh, wherever you kind of want to stream <laughs> movies, uh, Apple TV, Google Play, Amazon, for example. Um, but it's also kind of my mission within FIRE, which is to educate current and future generations about the centrality of freedom of speech to be who you are and to speak your mind. Now, Juliet, I, I said I would answer uh, two questions on that front, the the free speech question and then kind of the personal question. I manage a big team here at FIRE, uh, our communications team and our engagement and mobilization team. And um, early on in my career, I got some really good advice from a guy named Adam Liptak, who is the Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, but for many years, he worked in the general counsel's office at the New York Times. Um, he really wanted to work at the Supreme Court beat. But this woman, Linda Greenhouse, had been in it for decades. Uh, and he was worried that he would never get there. But he he thought that his best chance to get that job would to be, to be at the New York Times. And he told me, um, and my the group of people who were listening to him, I was working at the Institute for Justice at the time, that the best thing you can do in your career if you really want a job is to get near the basket. Which is to say, maybe take the job that you don't want, but if it brings you closer to, to getting the job that you want, to scoring the basket, so to speak, um, you'll put yourself far ahead of anyone else who'd be competing for that for that same job. I started my career at FIRE as Greg Lukianoff's assistant. Uh, I did not want to do expense reports. I did not want to do calendar invites, but I understood that fire was a new, unique place. And I wanted to be within the organization in hopes that one day, maybe I, if I prove myself and I did those expense reports, uh, knock out, bang up job on those expense reports. or those calendar, uh, events that maybe I would get that opportunity. And I was fortunate to have just that opportunity. Greg was coming out with his first book on, on learning Liberty. I had a background in advertising and marketing. And um, I volunteered proactively to help with publicity for the book. Uh, I like to think I did a good job, and that's how I transitioned into communications work, um, up to and including becoming VP of communications here at FIRE, and now I'm executive vice president. And so uh, my career has taken uh, a turn that I could only have wished for in my wildest dreams. Uh, and I, I feel like I had a similar experience to Adam Liptak. I put myself near the basket. So to speak. Congrats. And that's some really good advice. I'm, I'm taking a math class right now. This, I, every other time I say something, it'll be, oh, I'm making this analogy because I'm in a math class right now. Um, <laughs> Are you a math major? So I'm an econ and math major. So okay. kind of, I, I do math because I like economics, <laughs> <laughs> but there's this thing called the nestor, nested interval property where on the real number line within any interval, there's going to be more smaller intervals forever um, mm -hmm. until you get to a point because the rational number or the, the real numbers are infinite, this whole thing. Um, but it kind of put it, be getting near the basket and closer to the basket reminds me of the nested interval property because you can keep going into smaller and smaller baskets until you have the job and the job is the yeah. point. I don't know if yeah. that makes any sense. No, but. no, no, it does. It does, it does make sense. And, I, and, you know, I think to kind of expand on the point, sometimes we feel entitled to a certain job just because we know how much we want and how much we think we'd be good at it. But if nobody trusts you to do the little things right, no one's going to trust you to do the big things right. So Greg would have never trusted me to make Mighty Ira, which cost a half a million dollars to make. If he couldn't never have trusted me to do his expense reports or get his calendar correct, right? So like across your career, you're going to be presented with opportunities. And each one of those opportunities is an opportunity to prove yourself and how competent and skilled you are. And if you just kind of let it sail or phone it in 
on any of those because you think you're entitled to more or because you think that work is beneath you, nobody is going to trust you with the bigger job, the bigger responsibilities, the more costly and resource intensive responsibilities, such as making a movie, for example, or managing fires marketing budget, which I managed last year and it was $10 million. So I'd encourage, you know, particular people who are early career to get near the basket and to do the little things right. And opportunities have a way of finding themselves to people who do those jobs, those little things right all along the way. And I, I mean, this kind of is a nice transition or maybe it's not a nice transition and I just want it to be. <laughs> Let's do it anyway. But, um, <laughs> It it reminds me of fire's name change because it seems as though an opportunity presented itself. So before we get into that specifically, can you remind us what fire is, what the name change was, all of that? Yeah. So let me start actually with what fire was. So for 23 years of our existence, we were the foundation for individual rights in education, as you mentioned at the top of the show. And our mission was to defend the rights of students and faculty members to freedom of speech, academic freedom, press freedom, freedom of assembly, association, due process, sort of kind of the core individual rights uh, within the First Amendment. And we had a a tremendous amount of success uh, within that mission. We started tracking campus speech codes, which are policies that restrict uh, freedom of expression on college campuses in 2007. And uh, something like 80% of campuses had red light, which are the most egregious speech codes. And over the years, we just kept hammering on it through cases, our policy reform work, our legislative work. Um, and we got, we've gotten that number down significantly. I don't have the number at the top of my head right now, but down significantly the number of red light speech codes. Uh, we've, we've also won cases in the court of law and in the court of public opinion. But all along, we kind of heard a groundswell of interest from our supporters, sometimes people within staff, saying, you guys are principled, and we would love to see you kind of take your same brand of free speech advocacy and apply it to off-campus issues as well. And there were a couple of uh, New York Times articles and, and other articles in the popular press that came out in 2021 that almost explicitly called for fire or suggested that fire should step in and start doing that work. And uh, as a result, you got more of our supporters uh, interested in it. So we decided that that was the time to start planning for an expansion into off-campus free speech advocacy. Now, on campus, we do due process, we do religious liberty, we do press freedom. Off campus, we just focus on free speech. So that's an important distinction. Our goal is to be unapologetic advocates for free expression. We see free expression as central to uh, individual autonomy, to innovation, to creativity, to artistic expression, to peace, uh, to democracy, you name it. And unfortunately, you see too many free speech advocates these days uh, sort of throat clear or genuflect before other values before they issue their full-throated defense of free speech. Fire doesn't do that. We believe free speech is a fundamental human right, and we will not genuflect, we will not throw clear before defending it. And so, I mean, in terms of all rights, but I mean, that includes free speech. We used to have the ACLU that played a role in that. So how did that change and or what happened that allowed FIRE to kind of step into this space? Yeah, well, FIRE works with the ACLU regularly uh, on free speech issues, but the ACLU also has 19 different issue areas, right? If you go to their website and you go to issues, you can see all of the different issue areas that they have. And as a result, they kind of need to determine where to place their resources, what to privilege on their social media channels. Sometimes those issues can appear in tension. And one of those New York Times articles that I referenced earlier in 2021 written by Michael Powell, Powell, one of the ACLU's top free speech attorneys, was asked directly about FIRE. And he said, well, FIRE doesn't have the same sort of issues or tensions because they have one issue area, right? Freedom of expression. And and so it's a little bit easier for them. And the ACLU kind of saw some of the challenges in the wake of the Charlottesville events from 2017. But I've always kind of admired the ACLU's old school brand of civil libertarianism. That's why I made that 
documentary, Mighty Ira, about former ACLU executive director Ira Glasser. The ACLU's first annual report was the fight for free speech. That's what it was called. The second annual report was called A Year in the Fight for Free Speech. But over the years, of course, its mission had expanded or they you know, began focusing on other issues within the Bill of Rights. Um, and so perhaps necessarily the focus on freedom of spe- uh, expression diminished um, or became less of a focus, at least publicly, of some of the the work that they were doing. But, uh, you know, again, we work with the ACLU often, uh, both the national and the local chapters. Um, and our brand is a little bit different. You know, we don't just do litigation. We do um, public advocacy. We fight in the court of law and the court of public opinion, and we do so unapologetically. Uh, and through multiple media, including podcasts, films, as we mentioned, books. Um, so, um, you know, we work with all to do good and none to do harm to kind of paraphrase Frederick Douglass there. Um, and so we work with the ACLU quite a bit to do good. So, uh, yeah, when you mentioned that FIRE had done a really good job of making it so that a lot of schools' speech codes are no longer in the red, um, I, I thought about how important culture is in that um, because UVA has really good free speech codes, but we don't have a free speech culture. No one seems to want to talk. And if you do, they're, they're, it's, like, it's very mainstream. Like, we don't talk well, about this, that, and the other thing. Well, and, why is that? Do you think it's social media, Juliet? Well, so that's kind of what I wanted to ask you. I, I don't know. And obviously, Luke and and Jonathan Haidt have written about, like, what caused this thing to start. Um, I don't know. Like, something happened where it became acceptable to not want to engage and to not mm. want to think almost. I, that sounds really aggressive almost, but but it, I don't mean it to be. Um it it's just easier to not put yourself through thinking and engaging with ideas that are not your own. And that's always been the case. But I think social media has a part of it, but I don't entirely know how. I mean, maybe yeah. it makes it easier to have like the, the anonymity and the community of people who agree, the echo chamber thing. I don't know. Yeah, well... I hear this a lot from students, right? And I didn't really have the same experience. When I was in college, I graduated from Indiana University in 2012. And I can't ever say I, can't ever say I felt like I ever needed to self-censor. But then again, we did have, I think I got on Twitter in 2011, uh, had a Facebook page far before that. But this, this sort of culture on social media wasn't the same. And the same sort of call out or cancel culture wasn't there. Like if someone disagreed with you, your first instinct was almost never to like figure out how to get them punished or shut them up. That seems to be a instinct that's more exercised lately. Um, But you're right. So, you know, UVA has good policies. um, But what are what are the policies worth if no one will make use of them? Learned in hand. I think it was 1944. Learned Hand is this famous jurist from New York who uh, gave a speech. Darn, I think it's called the Spirit of Liberty, if I'm remembering it correctly, where he he essentially made the argument that uh, the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution um, are a parchment barrier, right? That it's imbued with meaning by those of us who seek to uh, live up to its ideals and. Uh, enshrine those ideals every day in how we go about our lives. And if we don't, then those protections for our rights become nothing more than a parchment barrier that can be thrown away by any authoritarian impulse that runs through society. And so it's important that we live out the values that are enshrined in our law, Um, but that it's easier said than done. Right. Particularly an environment where orthodoxy and conformity are encouraged and um, it feels quite stultifying. But that's nothing new either. Right. John Stuart Mill, when he wrote his seminal 1859 book on liberty, when he was making his seminal arguments for freedom of expression, he was making them in the context where. He's not talking about the law, he's talking about the culture, about the stultifying uh, 19th century Victorian England culture that made it so that people 
uh, who had wacky ideas or maybe correct ideas felt like they couldn't put them forth into the marketplace of ideas and, and, um, you know, engage in the sort of intellectual give and take that results in new truths. So it's maybe amplified by the fact that every crazy opinion that we have can now get amplified a thousand times on social media um, and therefore has, you know, potential greater costs, so to speak. Um, Maybe that's why people aren't speaking up as much, but fire feels strongly that, you know, criticism is also a form of free expression and that to live in a free society is um, sometimes hard, right? We, we argue that students are adults. They're not wilting flowers that they can, uh, if given the opportunity, uh, engage in the intellectual give and take that a college campus demands. Um, but at the same time, there are things that colleges and the culture can do to make that easier and less costly. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the culture of free expression point is also something that fire advocates for, um, kind of a set of cultural norms that, you know, should not be necessarily enforced by law. Um, but with that, nonetheless, we think are good for a free society. Um, and too often those norms are abandoned, you know, uh, Greg likes to use the example of, you know, you can understand a culture's, um, commitment to certain values by the idioms it adopts. When I was growing up, the, the phrase, it's a free country to each his own, um, sticks and stones, you know, may break my bones. Those were all things that were constantly, uh, mentioned or used, but not so much anymore. And you have to wonder why. That's a good point. The idioms. That's a good yeah, one. Well, so that's kind of what I wanted. Not to... my point. That's Greg's point. <laughs> <laughs> Proper credit where it's due. But I mean, you kind of already answered it a little bit, but this is something I've been wondering about is how different is it? Has it just become amplified? And has this problem always kind of existed? I, like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. You know, one of the the kind of Examples that I use to talk about fires expansion off campus is what was happening with Dave Chappelle in the early part of 2020, right? He, for your listeners who might not be familiar, he did uh, a very popular Netflix stand up show called The Closer, uh, which addresses um, transgender issues in a, a fairly nuanced way. Um, but nevertheless, he was, <laughs> there was, a, he was, trying to be canceled by a number of people who did not like the points he was making or the points they thought he were, was making. And so there was this whole campaign called cancel Chappelle hashtag cancel Chappelle. <clears throat> and now put yourself in the shoes of Reed, Reed Hastings and Ted Sarandos, the co-CEOs of Netflix at the time. You're all you're hearing from, from people, the activists um, is that we need to cancel Chappelle because his, his standup special is dangerous. So one of FIRE's goals is is to create a big tent organization that many people from across the political and ideological spectrum who care about free expression um, can gather. And we could put pressure on these institutions to do the free expression thing, right? Or in this case, the artistic expression thing, to stand up for principles of free artistic expression. We don't take down art because some people are offended by it. Um, and so we're, we're hoping to mobilize a community surrounding that, uh, when issues like that come up again, we fire wasn't expanded when that controversy arose. So we didn't get involved in that. We were still just on campus, but then again, you know, and going to your point about whether this is new, um, it's not, you know, the same sort of things were happening with George Carlin or Richard Pryor or Eddie Murphy when they were doing stand-up comedy, Lenny Bruce was driven to suicide in part. Uh, Granted, in those cases, it was often the government that was going after, you know, George Carlin for seven dirty words or Lenny Bruce for the jokes he would tell in a basement nightclub. Uh, Now you you don't have the government so much going after people as you do like uh, groups mobilizing on social media, which I fear is is kind of dangerous because where culture goes, the law often does as well. 
you have to wonder if the robust protections that we have for the First Amendment's protections for free speech will wane as the generations that have kind of grown up with cancel culture and participated in it become your doctors, your lawyers, your judges, uh, your influencers within the larger society. So we'll see. One of the best criticisms, and I don't entirely agree with it, that I heard about the free speech movement was I was reading this book about how we don't have free speech. We never had free speech and this whole thing. Um, And the guy said something along the lines of like, we forgot what free speech is and why we use free speech. And he basically explained it as like a crowbar. Like you use free speech. We don't protect um, free speech to have free speech, but we protect free speech for the benefits of it. Essentially, the change it brings in the conversations it makes us have. Um, And it was kind of an interesting. Well, yeah, I've heard that argument before. And there are lots of different reasons that you have freedom of speech right? There are benefits to democracy. There are benefits to science, to innovation, um, and many more kind of external benefits. But there's also the benefit of individual liberty, autonomy, agency, right? So if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, that like rights are only, are only useful in so far or or should only be protected in so far as they have a benefit for the larger society. But I say no. You know, to the extent extent I exist in this world, I should be free to be who I am and speak my mind so long as I'm not causing harm to other people. And when I say harm, I mean legally defined, often physical harm. Um, there are exceptions to free speech outlined by the First Amendment. I, I think those are thoughtful exceptions. The First Amendment's jurisprudence is our longest sustained meditation on how to have free speech in a free society. So things like um, incitement to imminent lawless action, true threats, uh, speech integral to criminal conduct, you know, those are real harms that I think should be accepted from the First Amendment. But aside from that, uh, we have rights as human beings that should be protected regardless of the benefits they have for the larger society. I should be able to exist in this world and bear witness to how I see it, regardless of whether someone else sees benefits in what I have to say. Um, There's plenty of art out there that is produced by people because they have a message that they want to tell. They have a story they want to tell. They have a message that they need to just get out of their heads. And even if nobody else finds benefit in that, I think there's value in people having the right and the ability to tell their own stories. Um, so I think that argument that you're relaying there, and I've heard it before, is just ignoring the individual liberty argument for free speech. So then what about the words are violence phrasing that people say? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's like a big thing on campus, and I just can't imagine that people actually believe that. But maybe they do because— My generation has never truly suffered. I mean, you could argue that the pandemic and the lockdowns and all of that, but we've never really had material suffering in any way. Well, the words are violence argument, I feel like, is is one of my least favorite arguments on the other (laughs) side of the free speech argument. So here's why. Throughout human history, uh, we have solved our disputes in most, mostly one way, through the use of actual violence. Uh, if we didn't like what you had to say, we burned you at the stake. We didn't like what you had to say, we threw you in prison. We didn't like what you had to say, we burned your books. We tortured you. We forced you to drink the hemlock. Right? We used violence to solve our disputes, sometimes religious disputes, sometimes political disputes. Right? You don't like what Jesus Christ had to say, we burn him on the cross, or we uh, nail him to the cross. One of the innovations of modern society that I think is most valuable is the use of words to solve our disputes. Sigmund Freud once said that civilization was founded the day man cast a word instead of a stone, and I think he's exactly right. In civilized democratic societies, we use our words to solve our disputes. Now, why is it a problem then to argue that words are violence? Well, I think it should be self-evident. 
If you say words themselves are violence, then logic dictates that you can use actual physical violence to respond to words. And once you make that argument, once that argument gains credence, then this whole civilization thing that Freud was referencing goes out the door. We no longer are leaving our guns at the door. Uh, They are now used to help solve our disputes. Right? So I, I... I don't love that argument. It just doesn't make sense either from kind of a rational standpoint, right? So one of the uh, proponents of that made wrote an essay in The Atlantic arguing that words are violence because words can cause trauma and stress and anxiety and prolonged trauma, stress and anxiety can have deleterious physical effects. Well, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then a prolonged dispute that I have with my wife is violence then a dispute or problem at work is violence or an argument with my friend that is stressing me out, giving me anxiety, preventing me from sleeping at night is violence. Nobody actually thinks that. It's a BS argument. Words are integral and the protection for words are integral to the protection of a free society. You throw out the distinction between words and physical violence and you lose a free society. I mean, it's it, it doesn't require that much engagement with the idea to kind of see that that logic doesn't necessarily track. And I mean, you can kind of even see that people respond to it when in the news there are reports on how when so-and-so got canceled or so-and-so got booed off the stage, there was physical violence from the people who wanted to shut them up. And most people just kind of roll their eyes, but it has a physical consequence. And a lot of people are kind of revolted by it almost. And to me, I think that this, the, the solution has to do with education. And I mean, you mentioned this before, like teaching history, teaching generally and actually using your free speech um and yeah, so no, absolutely. I guess, what do we do to reverse these trends especially if professors are i don't know if i want to say afraid but like there are consequences to their speech because the students hold such a power in some cases and i mean not even at the school level where the school can fire them but Kids won't take their classes because of word of mouth, and the culture is unaccepting even. So when um, Alan Charles Kors, one of the co-founders of FIRE, was a student at Princeton, uh, he had one professor. I forget what the the class was, but the professor was Marxist, and all the students knew that the professor was Marxist. And uh, for the final exam that year, the students had to write a paper and all the students wrote a paper uh, that kind of tipped their hats towards the professors or what they thought the professor wanted to hear because of his personal beliefs. And the professor grades the papers and as he's returning them to the students says to them, you have profoundly shamed me. I'm paraphrasing here from Professor Kors's retelling of it. You all wrote what you thought I wanted to hear. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to assign you the book that I most disagree with so far in the 20th century. And I want you to repeat its arguments in your own words so that I understand that you understand arguments on the other side of the issue. And that book was Frederick Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, and it changed the course of Alan Charles Kors' life. Uh, I, I don't think it's any stretch to suggest that perhaps fire wouldn't exist had that professor not assigned that book. Uh, professor Coors, when I'm referencing Professor Coors, he went on to teach the Enlightenment at the University of Pennsylvania, so that's why I'm using professor there. Um, so what does, that, what does that story mean? It means that we need to have faculty members who you know hold their own personal positions but also aren't I see it as kind of their affirmative duty to introduce students to perspectives from across the political and ideological divides so that students aren't just hearing one point of view and therefore kind of expect to only hear one point of view when they're on campus and get offended when they hear about other points of view, but are kind of brought up in a culture 
where they are bombarded with ideas from many different perspectives. I one time uh, attended a lecture at Indiana University that was, in fact, protested by students. This man, Douglas Wilson, who's an evangelical pastor from Idaho, was speaking on campus, and he said some controversial stuff uh, about LGBT rights and and slavery, um, and students tried to shout him down. And one thing he said during uh, the presentation that really stuck with me, and he was kind of saying it at the students, was, I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. This is essentially, I think, the mission or the kind of ethos that students should come into the university with. Uh, strong convictions loosely held. I always think I'm right, but I don't think I'm always right. Uh, we go into college or university uh, hoping, in a sense, to change our prejudices or biases or our untruths for truths. Uh, but you can only do that if you hold your convictions loosely. You have that epistemic humility. And far too often, I feel like because of the culture that young people, including myself, are raised in, uh, we feel like we need to adopt a position and then hold it really strong and never admit error. Uh, and I think that's dangerous for the intellectual exercise, um, but also for kind of a, a, a free society. So, I mean, when I think about this sort of issue, and I think when a lot of people do, the left often comes to mind um, as the ones who are pushing not necessarily an agenda, but who are silencing, canceling all that. But it comes from the right as well. I mean, you have conservatives who are pushing for censorship in higher education in order to fight wokeism and the left narrative. Can you talk to us a bit about how that dynamic kind of plays out and, I don't know, maybe yeah, correct sure. the, the, <laughs> correct the record. idea? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, to take it kind of out of the left-right paradigm. Yeah, uh, great. People suffer from the censor's curse, where when they get into power, censorship is often viewed as a convenient tool to affect the change that you want to affect. And so wherever kind of the locus of control is within these institutions, um, that's where you're going to find censorship. So on college and university campuses, uh, where the left is predominantly uh, in control or uh, predominant, you know, overrepresented, so to speak, most of the censorship is going to come from the left. In media, where the left is overrepresented, the censorship is going to come from the left. But you spoke about efforts in state legislatures, particularly Republican ones, where they hold the institution for power. And now they're, they also see censorship as a convenient tool to go after um, ideas that they don't like. I, I, I talk about how we live in the age of the politics of expediency, mm -hmm. where we seek out expedient tools to correct perceived problems, expedient tools uh, to find solutions to these problems, um, forgetting that the tools that we use, uh, the principles we exercise, can be used by our ideological en enemies uh, were they to gain power, right? So uh, you set the precedent for censorship in one context, because you're in power, you never know who the next president of the college or university is going to be, or the next president of the United States is going to be. You might trust Barack Obama with the tools of censorship, but do you trust Donald Trump? This uh, man, Norman Siegel, who used to run the New York Civil Liberties Union, I interviewed him for my documentary, Mighty Ira, said that if he could have any tattoo, it would be the phrase neutral principles tattooed across his chest. That is, you know, we've seen that uh, uh, Lady Justice, right, holding the scales of justice, and she's blindfolded, right? Because the principles that we bring into the judicial system are neutral ones. They're blind principles, right? Uh, so that we're not biased or prejudiced against um, anyone that justice has brought to bear on any. Uh, um, but as soon as you get into viewpoint discrimination, uh, you're you're uh, removing that blindfold. And that's a problem. Uh, 
So for years, free speech advocates, because uh, uh, liberals, so to speak, or the left uh, held power in college and universities and in the media, uh, there was a marriage of convenience with freedom of speech because freedom of speech was a tool for the minority, as we talked about earlier in the episode. Uh, but now conservatives are gaining power and they're seeing censorship and as an expedient weapon uh, to go after speech they don't like. John Stewart, the famous comedian from The Daily Show, once said that uh, as soon as if you abandon your principles, as soon as they're tested, they're not principles, they're hobbies. <laughs> so, so what we need at FIRE and what we're trying to build is a million person movement for free speech. And we have a lot of key performance indicators internally to track that. We're building our email lists, our social media followings to build a million person principled free speech movement that will go after the left, the right, and everyone in between when they try and reach for that expedient tool of censorship. And we're making progress in that front. We know these principled people are out there. I'm sure many of them listen to your show. So we encourage them to come under fire's big tent, so to speak, um, and join us in, in that fight. I mean, you've already kind of turned this whole thing around and kind of left us with this bit of optimism. But can you, can you... Tell us a bit about your feelings towards the future. Good? <laughs> Com complicated, right? Because um, I, I have a young son. He's 18 months old and, uh, and another son on the way. And so you start thinking a lot about the future when you're having kids. Um, I, I, one, I was one time uh, reaching out. You, you know, so all, all of us, I'm sure, listening to this had very influential teachers in our life, maybe one who kind of stands out. And I had one uh, in fifth grade. I won't use his name in case someone was able to track him down. Uh, and he was just, he had such an open mind uh, and taught us a ton. He would read us poetry and help. Uh, and you know, I had a band at the time, a fifth grade band. And he put on <laughs> a school play or he's put on a school performance for my band that let us play. And it was just like this, like he really tried to nurture interests and creativity and passions. And so when I was, uh, my wife was pregnant with our first son, I reached out to him and just said how much I appreciated kind of everything he did. I wrote him a letter, tracked him down um, and told him that I was expecting a son and how excited my wife and I were about it. And he wrote me back uh, a gracious note, of course, offered to, you know, if I was ever back in Chicago, I live in Virginia now, um, you know, to ever come, to come by and have lunch or, or something uh, with he and his wife. Uh, but there was another thing that he said that I'm hearing more often lately, which was, uh, you know, I, with everything going on in the world, listed things like climate change and the political environment and, you know, this, that or the other thing, you know, I'd, I'd think carefully before bringing another life into the world. And I just thought that that point suffered from a lack of perspective. And I wrote him this. I said, think back to someone born in 1900. They turn, what, 14, and World War I breaks out. A few years later, you get the Spanish influenza, which killed young people in droves. You go through the Roaring Twenties only to get uh, the greatest modern depression that we've seen. And just as you're coming out of the depression, uh, World War II breaks out. Authoritarianism was on the rise. Fascism was on the rise. Maybe you get drafted into that war. The West wins that war. Um, America wins that war. Uh, and then you get the nuclear bomb and the Cold War. And your kids maybe are hiding under desks uh, during drills for what's going to happen or what you're supposed to do if a nuclear bomb is to fall. And you live with that threat every day. And then you see the assassination of a president, John F. Kennedy. Uh, the assassination of his brother, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. You see bombs exploded almost every day in the United States of America. People forget how many bombs uh, attacks there were uh, during this period. And by the 70s, you're 70. Look at all that you had to see. Look at all the excuses you had to not bring another child into the world. Um, I, I just thought that suffered from a lack of perspective. So I, I, I try and remain optimistic um, that 
we have recency bias Mm -hmm. that to the extent bad things are happening uh, in our world right now, we think that it's unique to our time and place, but no, it's not unique to our time and place. These sort of fears have existed historically and in different contexts. And sometimes a rational mind uh, would be right to say that they were worse, that it was more common in the United States of America a hundred years ago to question where your next meal was coming from. It was more common in the United States of America a hundred years ago uh, to fear the risks of childbirth or illness or disease. Um, We live in a, a challenging times, we live in interesting times, we live in different times. Um, but the fears that were expressed by my teacher, um, I think, are nothing new and are somewhat short sighted and ahistorical. Thank you so much for sharing. I wish I had more time to ask you a million more questions because <laughs> that's all good. Everyone knows I have them, but I have one more question for you. Sure. Um, what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Yeah, so I, um, my name is Nico Perino. So you might imagine that I grew up in a uh, Italian Catholic family and we would go to church every Sunday, Catholic mass. And, uh, I was confirmed Catholic, did the whole Holy communion stuff, uh, did all the, the rigmarole that you have to do to get confirmed in eighth grade. Um, and then, you know, nine 11 happened and I became interested in the writings of what were termed the four horsemen. This is Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Sam Harris. Uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris are are still kind of on the scene, but Christopher Hitchens died in 2011. And so I became, at that point, um, they they weren't just atheists, they were anti-theists. And I I would kind of count myself among that camp as well. Um, But over time, so I I changed my mind there, but over time I've, I'm I'm not particularly religious um, still. Uh, I'd I'd probably count myself agnostic, um, maybe marginally atheist, but I'm definitely not anti-theist because I've I've grown as I've gotten older to appreciate some of the fundamental principles that are taught in religion. That is the idea of forgiveness, redemption. I think both of those values have something to say about cancel culture too but also the sort of community that religion create can create and the sort of meaning it can create for people in their lives. Uh, and so I found over time that I've started to value what religion can do for people uh, more than I did when I was a young <laughs> 12 or 13 year old reading God is not great or the God delusion, uh, so to speak. And it was railing against theism in all of its forms. So my journey uh, around the issue of religion has been winding and uh, it's still changing to this day. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote@gmail.com. at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.